Awesome. So that being said, I am going to welcome Katrina from Sage Therapeutics. And Trisha and Jane, just to let you know, if you want, you guys obviously are welcome to stay. Um, you can also throw your videos off. So all good to go, but I'll leave it up to you guys. Um, but Katrina, it's a pleasure for you to be joining us as the medical director of Sage Therapeutics, giving us kind of a, a, a research update on what you guys have been up to and just really excited to have you here. Um, I just want to make a quick reminder to those that are uh, attending and listening in. If you do have any questions, you know, put in the chat or put in the Q&A area that you'll see below and we'll answer it at the end of the session. And I'm going to stop talking and just pass it on over to you. So you're good to go. Fantastic. Um, hold on, let me can you guys see me okay yep we can see your presentation you're good to go <clears throat> all right well thank you so very much for that um that lovely oh wait you can't see me though yeah i guess i'll, I'll leave this up here um so thank you so much seth for that great uh introduction um as seth said i'm katrina pommier and i'm a medical director at sage therapeutics and I am thrilled to be here today to um, provide a research update on our Huntington's disease program. <clears throat> so these are my disclosures. And um, so this is just a brief uh, agenda for what we'll be covering today. Um, so I will first introduce you to Sage Therapeutics in case you don't know who we are. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the impact that cognitive impairment has in Huntington's disease and what we're specifically looking um, to address. Um, and then I'll provide an, a nice overview of our perspective program in Huntington's disease. So who is Sage Therapeutics? Um, well, we are uh, a biopharmaceutical company that is really committed to developing new therapies and novel therapies at that um, with the potential to transform the lives of um, people who are suffering from many of these debilitating brain disorders. Um, we really are a wellness company and, and very focused on brain health. Um, and we're continuing to advance um, our leading health or um, and leading a brain health portfolio um, that, that crosses um, multiple uh, disease states. Um, we do have one product that's approved currently for postpartum depression, and we have seven clinical candidates that are currently under investigation across a variety of diseases, um, brain diseases in particular. Um, and we have an ongoing um, growing library uh, that at at present consists of about 6,000 proprietary compounds. Now, SAGE is headquartered in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, here we have um, already more than 400 employees. Uh, we are rapidly growing. Um, and many of them, like SAGE has really um, embraced kind of this remote culture. And so uh, many of us do uh, work remotely. <clears throat> And um, as I mentioned, SAGE is incredibly focused on disorders where there's a high unmet need for treatment options. Um, and we're working diligently to really try and understand some of the underlying mechanisms um, for uh, many of these brain disorders um, so that we can really address the current gaps in treatment. Our research and development efforts primarily focus on the modulation of GABA and NMDA receptors. And these are neurotransmitter systems and networks that um, are critical in neuroplasticity and in memory and learning. And the differentiated approach that uh, SAGE takes to drug, drug discovery and development has really provided um, a unique opportunity to create a broad pipeline of potential therapies um, that cover a wide range of psychiatric, neurological, and brain disorders. And conceptually, when we think about this, we're looking at um, uh, providing an impact or making an impact across the entire lifespan. So when you think about people who are suffering from disorders um, at, at birth or shortly thereafter in the neurodevelopmental space, um, also those that, uh, that are impacted as a result of injury or insult, and that can happen at any time in your life where we're looking at um, neuro rehabilitation efforts. Um, and then of course, those that are impacted at the later stages of life in neuro, with neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's disease. Um, 
So that's a little bit about SAGE. Uh, and now I'm gonna switch gears and, and talk a little bit about um, cognitive impairment in Huntington's disease. And what we've learned at SAGE is that, um, especially when these very uh, early or mild changes begin in a patient's life, that there really is nothing mild about the mild cognitive impairment. And so this slide, um, this slide <clears throat> you can see um, depicts how cognition exists along a spectrum where the difference between normal cognition and um, dementia is determined by an individual's functional abilities. So we know that everyone experiences slight cognitive changes during aging. However, it's when these cognitive changes begin to become a concern for the individual themselves without necessarily um, interfering or preventing them from doing their typical activities. That, that is when this would be called mild cognitive impairment. Um, so an example of that would be, for example, you're at work and um, you're starting something that would normally take you 15 minutes is starting to take you an hour or more. Um, you're having difficulty prioritizing or multitasking. Um, and, and so some of those very initial um, changes that might seem mild um, can be very impactful and ultimately lead to a loss of independence. Um, and then <clears throat> further down um, along this spectrum, when uh, cognitive changes become, uh, be begin to um, become affect multiple domains of cognition and become severe enough that they do begin to interfere with these activities of um, daily living, that's when it's considered dementia. And it's important to note that um, mild cognitive impairment and dementia are not the specific diseases themselves, but rather they represent a stage or a severity along this continuum of cognition. And both are usually um, caused by some underlying disease or condition, like Huntington's disease, for example. So what is cognition? I've been throwing this term around quite a bit. So we thought it would be important to first level set and ensure that everyone understands what we're talking about when we use the term cognition. And in particular, how we at SAGE um, are thinking about disorders of cognition differently than others have in the past. So cognition in a few words is really the sum of all of our mental abilities. And I know that that's a fairly abstract definition. So to better explain it, um, I, we've broken it down um, into these very different parts here. So you can see that there's six circles that are highlighted on this slide. And these are the key cognitive domains as they're defined by the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And it's a published um, document by the American Psych Psychiatric Association. And due to time today, I won't have time to go through all of these different domains, um, but I'll highlight a few that you're aware of. So the first on the right side of the screen is um, attention. And attention is really the ability for us to focus on the task at hand while tuning out everything else, which is important. It's an important thing to do <clears throat> um, uh, when you're driving, for example. Um, you're probably also familiar with the concept of learning and memory, um, which is the ability to take in information and file it away or process it in the brain's internal organization system, but then be able to recall it and retrieve it at the appropriate time and place. But there's one domain um, that hasn't really been talked about enough, and that's the domain of executive function. And so if you think about it, um, if you think about, for example, an executive, what do they do? They make decisions, right? And so while you need all of these domains working together intricately in order to be able to function at normal capacity, um, it's really this executive functioning um, that is the mother of all the other domains and really pulls the whole thing together. And changes in this domain in particular are what um, are critical to uh, people losing their independence as they begin to have difficulty managing their medications, their finances, driving their car, or even going shopping. So executive function is really what controls our ability to plan, make decisions, and also roll with the challenges or, or new situations that we're presented with. Um, really under, under lies these core skills that allow us to move seamlessly through a world where things are constantly changing and evolving. Um, and this allows us really to, to be able to react and adapt in real time. And so when you start to have challenges or changes um, that prevent you from being able to multitask or to plan ahead, 
um, or make important decisions. Um, I like to think of executive function, think of driving as an example of this, right? So when you think about your ability to drive, um, you have to multitask, right? You have to look in your mirror, you have to look behind you and make sure that nobody's coming up behind you to know how far you are ahead of the car, when you have to push on your brakes. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are being pulled in that allow you to drive. Um, and so while we understand the importance um, and, and the, uh, the, what, how important executive functioning is in many of these daily tasks that you do, what we really wanted to know more about was how do these early changes um, really impact individuals with Huntington's disease, and particularly those um, early in their uh, disease journey. And so in order to do that, we partnered with um, some fabulous advocacy groups, um, many of which you know, right? The Huntington's Disease Society of America and HDYO, um, in order to recruit and interview 35 participants, including 25 individuals in the early stages of Huntington's disease and their care partners. Um, and what we wanted to understand was when these changes occur and how impactful they are to them. And here's what we learned. So um, as I mentioned uh, in the field, um, <clears throat> this executive functioning has often been overlooked. Um, and there's, so because of that, it, there are not a lot of um, reliable or accurate scales or tests that doctors can do to identify these very early, um, sometimes invisible changes uh, that, that people that are become very impactful to um, a participant or a patient's life. Um, and so one example of this is if you go to the uh, doctor and he asks, how are things going at work? Um, some of the responses could be fine, not bad, um, not, not as good as it used to be, but hanging in there, right? Um, and so some of these changes uh, that are hidden to others that are looking at you um, can be incredibly impactful. Um, and while they can be referred to often as mild, it doesn't mean that it has a mild impact on the patient's lives. And so upon further probing in conversations with those participants, we learned that changes in executive functioning and capacity have real effects on their ability to stay employed even. So if you look at some of these examples that were provided, you can see that one person is discussing making mistakes at work and how they feel stupid. Um, and then another example is that this per person is having a hard time shifting priorities, that it's, it's taking longer for them to be able to shift between different tasks that they're working on. Another cannot write to meet their deadlines, right? So they're, they're having difficulty meeting those important timelines at work. Um, and then another person is having a difficult time staying on task. Um, and so as you can see from these examples, uh, cognitive impairments can often um, impact one's ability to maintain independence. And this is a real highly unmet need um, in uh, the treatment of Huntington's disease. And one that SAGE is, um, is really uh, involved in, in helping to address. And in doing so, um, I would like to now, so now we understand what the impact is of mild cognitive impairment and how detrimental it can be to patients. I wanna switch gears a little bit to talk about um, our research and development efforts um, on SAGE 718, which is uh, a investigational therapy that is currently being evaluated for use in Huntington's disease from the impairment. So SAGE 718, as I just mentioned, it is investigational, it's not approved, um, and it's being evaluated to treat cognitive impairment associated with neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's disease. And we have a, a broadly um, uh, named perspective program. And so this program has really incorporated an innovative strategy using a group of studies that will build upon each other um, in order to better understand the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of SAGE 718 and those that are impacted by cognitive impairment associated with Huntington's disease. And so if you look on the slide here, um, you can see the breakdown of the different studies. So on the left here is our dimension study. And this is our primary efficacy and safety study. On the right is the surveyor study. And this is a real world functioning study. And then both of these studies will ultimately feed into our open label safety extension study. And so just to provide a little more detail here, the dimension study um, will really help us understand the effect that SAGE 718 has on cognitive performance in Huntington's disease. 
Now this study began enrolling in late 2021 um, <clears throat> with the um, goal of enrolling across 50 clinical sites globally. And we do uh, anticipate that enrollment will remain open through 2023. The surveyor study, on the other hand, um, is really uh, aimed at validating the magnitude of difference um, to distinguish Huntington's from non-Huntington's uh, controls uh, on measures of cognitive and functional status. And it will be impact grit and will also um, be very important in helping us to tell the value of um, improving function for patients by connecting those changes that happen in the cognitive tests to actual real world functions. And then ultimately the open label study um, will aim to uh, understand the impact of SAFE 718 and participants over a long period of time and also evaluate the impact that it has on a participant's function. And then we didn't do this in a vacuum. Like here at SAGE, um, we uh, are highly um, involved in the Huntington's community. Um, and so there have been um, a host of additional programs um, that and supporting activities that, that we've been involved in. Um, I will tell you, I've worked at multiple companies and um, SAGE really does um, care about the patient perspective and, and has they have brought in, um, in every aspect and function um, internally, the patient's perspective. Um, and so uh, you can see here, we've been working um, very closely with a lot of the advocacy agencies in the community. Um, they review our protocols to make sure that we're not um, uh, inducing too much burden on patients when, when we're trying to assess these, these cognitive changes. So um, they have been invaluable uh, in helping us with this strategy. Um, we also have um, gotten input from the physician community via clinical advisory boards. Um, we really wanna make sure that we understand the challenges that clinicians are um, dealing with when trying to um, evaluate some of these early changes. We wanna understand the natural history, right? So um, the impact that a potential therapy could have in holding a person at a certain stage so that they don't decline to those more severe, um, those more severe symptoms. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, one of the big gaps in care or one of the big gaps in the field really was um, a, a measure that could reliably and accurately identify um, those most meaningful changes that occur early on for patients. And so Sage, through those interviews um, that were supported by the advocacy community, um, they were able to develop a patient reported outcome scale uh, that was just recently validated. And of course will be shared back with the community. And we're always uh, uh, looking for feedback from Huntington's families um, and individuals that are impacted by Huntington's disease uh, as you guys are the reason that we do this, this work. So a bit more um, uh, details around our dimension study. So it is a phase two study um, that is being done to evaluate the effect of stage 718 versus a placebo on cognitive performance and daily function, as well as the quality of life in participants who are suffering from mild cognitive impairment in, with HD. Um, SAGE 718 is an oral medication, and so we'll be looking also to evaluate the safety and tolerability um, of this medicine. Uh, and then <clears throat> for those uh, who are eligible to participate in our trial, um, the duration is approximately four months long uh, with a total of nine in-person clinic visits um, throughout the course of the study. Um, as I mentioned, the study is actively enrolling individuals right now. We have five sites activated across um, the United States with a number of um, additional sites that will be added um, throughout the first half of this year. In order to qualify uh, to participate in the dimension study, participants must be between 25 and 65 years old, have genetically confirmed Huntington's disease with pre-manifest to early manifest disease presentation. Um, no features of juvenile Huntington's disease. And then of course, um, there's a, a, a list of uh, other health requirements that must be met. Now testing will be performed um, by the study doctor in order to um, ensure that participants are a good fit for this trial. And it's important to call out that um, anyone uh, who has um, participated in a previous SAGE trial um, or um, a previous gene therapy or any other drug or biologic or even device trial within the past 189 days um, would be excluded from participating in this trial. 
as you can see here, these um, are the list of our dimension study sites. And as I mentioned, we have five that are actively enrolling at, at right now um, in Inglewood, Colorado, in Farmington, Michigan, Honolulu, Hawaii, Boca Raton, Florida, and Memphis, Tennessee. And then these additional cities will be um, opening for enrollment, as I said, in the first half of this year. Um, if you uh, are not near one of these sites that will be opening, travel support is and can be made available. So please um, do reach out um, and we could potentially work something out there. Um, and then additional sites will be also um, uh, activated in Australia, Canada, and UK throughout 2022. So if you're interested, um, there are multiple places where you can go to learn more. Um, so the dimension study itself has its own website. So you can go to www.focusonhd.com um, for more details. Of course, clinicaltrial.gov and HD Trial Finder all have information about the dimension study. And of course, you're welcome to reach out to us here at SAGE. Um, you can email any study inquiries or questions to clinical trials inquiry at sagefarx.com. And so with that, I would really like to thank you all for your time and engagement um, and, and just reiterate that we at SAGE do believe that looking at the brain and seeing it differently can make a world of difference to patients suffering from Huntington's disease with not cognitive impairment. So thank you so much. And um, I guess do I turn this back over to, State, uh, to Seth now? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Katrina. And, and thanks again for just providing this awesome update. You know, as someone who is part of the HD community, you know, it's, it's amazing just to see, you know, all these different potential treatment options that are, um, are being offered. And, you know, I'll say personally, I'm excited just because hearing the whole kind of pre-manifest which is something that I've always, you know, I've never been able to qualify for a study because I'm not considered sick enough. And so to me, it's kind of like, oh, okay, maybe here's my time to help advance research. So I'm excited personally for it. I've also just full disclosure, had an opportunity to work with some of your colleagues and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's felt good because it's felt like that collaborative effort, which I think is always important when we're trying to work in research and drug development. So with that being said, um, you know, th there were a few questions I got. And so I figured I will ask them and, and hopefully see the best or figure out if there's a, if there's a opportunity for you to answer them. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. But one of it, you mentioned, um, you know, nine clinical visits um, within four months. And so wondering, especially understanding, you know, the pre-manifest, right, they're still, for the most part, fully independent. So are these um, you know, would you say these are full days, half days, and like, you know, are there options to potentially offer this on, on, the, on the weekends? And the reason for it is just kind of thinking about nine PTO days for someone that may be working full time or may not be able to take as much time off. Right. And that, I mean, I think that's a really good um, point to consider for sure. And, and I know that I, I, our trials, um, so this is a, not an invasive therapy, right? So we're not doing imaging. You're not going to have to do like a lumbar puncture or anything like that. So um, the, really the bulk of the um, visit is, is focused on uh, the cognitive testing and, and maybe some blood samples for um, pharmacokinetic analysis. So the, 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 each of the visits is not a full day by any means. And of course, we're always willing to work with um, people's schedules, right? I mean, I think I think that clearly we know that this is a working uh, working population, and and we don't want you to have to take nine PTO days. That would be that would be asking a lot. So um, of course, I think that um, all of the sites would be willing to work with with you as far as those those things go. But it That's would be awesome. on the you know an individually an individual okay. site basis. I can't speak for all, you know, everyone, but, but hopefully that we could make something work out for sure. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. It's, it's always going to be site by site, but also seeing, you know, all the potential sites, that's awesome. And so with that actually being said, if someone, if there's not a site near someone, how do they like get alerted? Like, for example, I'm in Chicago. And if I'm like, I saw Chicago on that list, I was, I'm excited, but like, how do I make sure to, to just get alerted? Is there, what's the best way to go about that? 
Right. So I, I think you can check um, on trialfinder.com and as the sites come online, uh, those will be um, posted. So I think that um, that's a good place. You can always reach out to Sage, like I said, or check the Dimension website as well, because it will be posted there as well. Awesome. Awesome. And then uh, one final question, and this is something that I've personally heard in, in the community and just something that I'm curious your thoughts are. When someone tests positive, right, it's are they considered diagnosed or are they considered a gene carrier because they're still because they're still pre-symptomatic and I don't want to get too much in the weeds but like you know mentioning pre-manifest you know is that considered then for definition for what you guys are looking for as diagnosed or uh, I'm just wondering I don't right. know if you're able to answer that <laughs> Um, so no, it's a good question. I think that it's genetically um, confirmed, but you don't have to have um, the you know the the motor symptoms of by any means. In fact, many many people in our trials won't. So um, again, it's really just you. Um, the TFC range is um, six to, to less than thirteen, I think. So um, uh, that's kind of the range that we're looking for. And, and so if you um, you know are starting to have these sorts of challenges with your thinking and your thoughts and um it, you might be a good fit if you if you fall into that range so uh absolutely you don't have to necessarily be um at that that definitive motor onset um definition if you will awesome awesome i appreciate you answering these questions and just really thank you again for the work you you and the rest of your team at sage is is really doing to help try to advance research in, in HD, especially, you know, specifically focusing on that, that cognitive piece, which I think is so essential. Um, so I think um, one last, sorry, one last kind of final question. Someone did ask, um, you know, why isn't Sage uh, doing juvenile Huntington's disease? Right, so that's a good question. And I don't know that I uh, am the right person to answer it. I will say, you know, that this is, um, uh, we are trying to move this forward, right? And it doesn't mean that we're going to um, ignore the, um, the young population by any means. Um, I think that that might just come later, right? So I think that um, in order to, uh, I, we're trying to investigate this in as homogeneous of a population as possible to really understand if it would benefit, right? And then we can expand beyond that in the future. Um, but so I, 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 I know I, under, I understand how frustrating it must be uh, to, to have this, this um, early onset and, and not um, be able to participate. But um, I will take that back to our team and, and we can discuss it and, and figure out, you know, if and when uh, we would be able to um, include uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Katrina, for, for answering that. And I, I, I highly recommend for everyone, you know, check out their booth. They're, they're in the exhibit hall. Um, you can always ask questions there. You can check out more information about this, the study and, and the great work that they're doing in the HD space. And so don't, don't be afraid to reach out to them using the chat function on your tap navigation. So with that being said, um, I'm I believe we have a 15 minute break or I'm going to say now a 13 minute break followed by an update from Unicare, which will be on track one and then a panel on dealing with behavioral issues on track two. Thank you again, Katrina. And with that being oh. said, we will see you all soon. Thanks everyone. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you.